Welcome to the Neutral Podcast, where we discuss paving the way to a sustainable tomorrow. I'm Nate Helbach, your host, founder, and CEO of The Neutral Project, a sustainable real estate development company. Join us each week as we host world-renowned guests and explore dynamic landscapes of real estate development, alternative investing, sustainability, forestry, urbanism, and new cutting edge carbon neutral construction materials that are shaping the cities of tomorrow. Welcome back to the Neutral Podcast. Today we're joined by Jeff Rismo, who is partner and CIO at Gale. Jeff has 20 years of experience advising public and private sector clients in Europe, North America and South America and the Gulf. Jeff studied architectural engineering at the University of Colorado, not far from where he grew up, but now he lives in Copenhagen, and that's where he is calling in from today for the last roughly 22 years. He did his uh, one-year master's in city design and social science at London School of Economics and Political Science, which he actually did with our chief product officer, uh, Daniel Gleasel. And Jeff believes the environment shapes human flourishing. And if we shape places with curiosity, kindness, and the ambition of inviting all life to thrive, it will. Today, we will be discussing the evolving landscape of urban design, sustainability, and building communities. Jeff, thanks for coming on. Happy to have you here. If you could uh, maybe just start off with a little background of kind of your personal life and growing up in Colorado, that would be awesome. Yeah, for sure. Uh, a pleasure um, to join you here. And so, yeah, so as you mentioned, I've been in Copenhagen now for um, almost 23 years. And it's kind of interesting background, you know, where I grew up in Colorado, but my grandfather uh, was Danish. He was born in, in Copenhagen. He immigrated to the States during World War II. Uh, he followed his big brother, who was a furniture designer, Guy named Jens Riesem. He's had a little bit of a um, renaissance here lately, so you can um, Google him and get some of his furniture at Design Within Reach. Um, so you had this like European heritage, but me, I was very much um, in you know Colorado, kind of far from that. Um, my dad grew up in in Long Island, you know, in New York with his Danish father, my grandfather, and with his German grandmother. And at that point, you know, you wanted to just be American. Um, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, especially if you were German, right? You didn't want to really admit that. So uh, my dad grew up not learning any Danish or German. They were just New Yorkers. Um, and he re- he wanted to get away from that kind of lifestyle and go be an actor in LA. And as he was driving across the country, his car broke down in Colorado, uh, almost made it. And uh, that's that's why I ended up in, in Colorado. So uh, I grew up there in this you know really generic town called Pueblo. Uh, Pueblo means town in Spanish, so it couldn't be more more generic, actually. Kind of a typical, you know, working class, um, working class town, steel mill, um, mostly Hispanic um, population. I was sort of the odd one out being a, a white kid, um, blonde hair, mullet uh, kind of guy trying to act like I was uh, Hispanic, Mexican, because most of my friends were um, so interesting, you know, trying to fit into that environment. And then I would go out to New York, to Long Island to see my grandparents and spend time with them. And that was a very different environment. And so even from a young age, uh, as a kid, I was sort of fascinated with how people lived quite differently. Um, and my kind of spread out, you know, car dominated, very working class part of Colorado, and then how they lived very differently in this like higher upper end kind of, you know, yacht club sailing um, green lush area in, um, in New York. So I was always a little bit fascinated by those differences and how essentially this idea of like, you know, how culture, how, who your friends are, who you, your identity, who you claim to be is shaped so much by, um, the environment that you live in. And and not only the difference between sort of New York and Colorado, but also, you know, is it green or not? Is it spread out? Is the built, are the buildings old or small? Um, are the, houses larger, uh, larger, small. So I sort of had that built into my curiosity uh, from from a young age, not really having a name for it or anything. Um, so grew up there, um, wanted to be an engineer, went to Boulder, uh, University of Colorado in Boulder, um, 
studied engineering, super like, you know, architectural engineering, very, you know, building systems, structures, how to building stand up, how do you build them? Very, very practical calculations. Uh, there's one right answer. Um, and I kind of like that. Uh, but when I studied in Denmark to find my roots, uh, I had a chance to study architecture in Copenhagen in 1999 uh, to get back to my, you know, Danish roots of my grandfather. Um, I studied here. I One of the first lectures I attended uh, was from Jan Gale, um, the, the namesake of our company, Gale. Um, so Jan, at that point, you know, really opened up my eyes to this whole idea of sociology and architecture and the way that we live and what we build and how the built environment shapes our life. And all of a sudden, my childhood history of of being curious about these things between Colorado and New York and wondering about my own kind of how I fit in and how society works began to make a little bit of sense uh, hearing Yan hearing Yan talk about it. So it was a really inspiring, eye-opening moment. And I almost instantaneously said, you know, I want to come back and work for that guy. Uh, this is amazing. Um, and about a week later, I met my now, now wife, um, I told her the same thing. I want to come back to Copenhagen to work for Yan. She was a little bit offended that it had more to do with him than her, but hey, it was early in our relationship. Um, and uh, I also, you know, met like 30 Danish cousins from my grandfather's brother's family. So I had these, you know, three really good reasons to come back to Copenhagen, which I did in 2001 after I graduated. Um, my extended family, my wife and uh, and Yan and um I joined Gail then uh, in 2004 after, you know, a three-year stint um, doing various things, sort of being a glorified travel uh, guide here around in Europe, uh, but joined Gail and, um, you know, really uh, went off from there. So that's kind of a long, uh, long background, but we could talk about, uh, that's at least part one to your question. <laughs> yeah. And how did you uh, find Daniel at London School of Economics? <laughs> yeah. So, you know, so I worked at Gale from 2004 um, into 2008, really. And I felt like I got my, you know, my, I got my urban design degree uh, on the job uh, by working at uh, Gale during that time. And, you know, my boss and Yan and others were like, that's great. You got your undergrad urban design by being here. Uh, you should go really get make that official. <laughs> so there's this great program at London School of Economics um, called City Design and Social Science. As you mentioned, it really combines, you know, half of the students are architects half of them are sociologists and anthropologists and they force us to work together. And um, Daniel was also one of the, uh, one of the students that year. I think he was a, a part-time student. I was full-time and um, you know, it's just indicative of like the people that come from around the world. I think we're 25 people. I think there was 18 different nationalities and uh, really forced us to work in this multidisciplinary environment, which is what city building is all about. Um, and after I did that, one and a one year stint. That's another another advantage of master's degree in the UK. They're a year long. Um, pretty intense though. Uh, I went back to back to Gale essentially, and then um, sort of the, the rest of my career took off from there. But um, it was a fun time to overlap in um, in London with him. A great program. It's still going. Doing a lot of research. Uh, working with um, you know um, this sort of the interface between research, design, sociology. It's a I think kind of how the future of city city planning city making city design education should actually be so it's a good model yeah that's so cool also to hear that uh your it was your uncle right that does the uh design within reach <clears throat> yeah yeah so it's my grandfather's brother so he's my great uncle um, okay yes uh yes recent and, and yeah it's a cool kind of thing to kind of you know come back here so you know colorado kid i didn't have a passport until i studied in here in 99 but I have these European roots. I come back to uh, Denmark, you know, my last name, Riesum. People are like, hey, are you related to this Danish designer? It's like, yeah, he's my great uncle. Uh, he went, he left Denmark to go to the States. I left the States to come to Denmark. Uh, <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, you know, it's nice. I think those are cool kind of full circle stories. And also um, where there's a little bit of design, you know, maybe DNA in people and mine's just at a very different scale than, um than Jens, but it's a it's a legacy I'm really proud of. Yeah, yeah, my wife loves that uh, brand. We have a few of his pieces, so it's uh, yeah. definitely very cool. Um, for those who are listening that maybe don't know that much about Gale and what you guys do, could you just give us a little overview of like what the core thesis of Gale is and what you have been working on the last two decades? Yeah, so you know, so Jan 
Uh, so Gail is, like as I mentioned, a person's name, Jan Gale. Um, he's about 86 years old now. He wrote this really seminal book uh, in 1971 called Life Between Buildings. And so Jan came out in the modernist architecture period. This is when, um, you know, Le Corbusier and Arne Jakobsen and these, you know, people that really treated architecture as an art form and as something that you view from above. Um, it's like a machine, the city is a machine, um, buildings are art. Um, and he came, he was educated in that field, but he ended up marrying a developmental psychologist and she kind of always challenged him about, Hey, you know, like, why don't architects care about people? You know, what about the people that inhabit your buildings? What about the citizens in these cities that are supposed to be a machine? What about the, you know, mothers and fathers and kids that grow up in these buildings that are supposed to be pieces of artwork. So, you know, Yan, um, that really, so this idea of life between buildings, this idea of um, how we live and what we build it drove his academic career. Um, and from the seventies up to, you know, 2000, he was writing books and uh, in influencing academia. Um, but, and, and that sort of formed the basis of the practice of the design practice scale, uh, which was, started in 2000. And so we try to build upon that legacy of, um, of sociology, of understanding human behavior. Um, Yen, you know, in writing that book, Life Between Buildings, he went to Italy and he got data uh, and information about how people were using the square in Siena and how many pedestrians um, were walking on Champs-Élysées in Paris and um, really was able to then, together with his wife, like develop a little bit more of a thesis around how, um, how architecture impacts um, lifestyles. But, you know, he developed methods that were somewhat quantitative and qualitative. Um, and so as he came back to Copenhagen and was working as an academic, he started collecting data um, in Copenhagen and other cities around the world that he could then use as evidence to essentially, you know, um, fight and have good arguments with traffic engineers. And so that whole idea of, you know, anthropology, ethnography, getting data, um, using that in information to then design um, and being very focused on um, the life between buildings is what our, our practice is about. So, you know, we advise mayors, we work with real estate developers, we work with um, corporations like Google and Ford and Lyft. We work with um, institutions like the World Bank. Um, we work with foundations and and sort of in all those cases, we're basically trying to understand um, human behavior, how it um, should give us clues as strategists, as urban policymakers, as ur urban planners. And then we take those clues and translate them into um, uh, into uh, into design. So that's, again, we can talk a lot more about that, but that's the sort of ethos and that translates uh, itself in many different ways. Yeah, I think that's a good transition to our next segment. And I'll uh, add in to the show notes the uh, link to Jan's uh, book because it's but definitely been influential in the neutral project and kind of our core thesis around sustainability. But he has this really interesting idea of the interplay between life and form. And I think it's something that, you know, as developers and architects, we probably don't think about as much as we should and think about how like these buildings really meet the street and actually have this kind of nice opening arms welcomeness to them. So that's something that, yeah, that's been really key for us to look at. Um, I mean, it's been a huge guide for us with looking at Gail's book and then also looking at others. But like, how do you see this kind of like human centric design from your lens, Jeff? And how does that affect your practice? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that you know, I alluded to this idea of of data, of observing, you know, the human animal in their natural habitat, <laughs> which is um, neighborhoods, its streets, its communities. So we try to always, you know, observe um, and we've created digital tools and all kinds of different methods to um, basically meet people where they are uh, to understand what their everyday habits are. And so it's interesting, you know, you have a lot of citizen engagement processes where you take the inputs of the people that attend the the meeting or that go to the design charrette or, um, you know, show up at city hall and like start complaining about stuff. And I think what we try to do uh, in our work is go to where people are. So we go to the street corners, we go to the, um, you know, the schoolyards um, and we 
uh, talk to people. We ask them questions they are expert in. Um, so things like, what is your favorite place? Uh, where do you take your, your, your kids in your free time? Where do you feel safe with your grandmother uh, to cross the road? So all kinds of like very basic questions. Um, we observe people, you know, uh, observe uh, on a street, how many people go by throughout the course of a day, a uh, week, year. Um, and we sort of build. Um, so for us, that's what human centered design is, right? Is like really trying to understand what's going on, what people's preferences are, what they tell you, what they, what you can observe. We have developed a lot of online tools where people can, um, uh, again, there's lots of people that do this today, but um, it was sort of, you know, more um, uh, leading edge um, uh, 10, 10 years ago or so. And that's why we keep on developing new tools and methods. But for us, human centered design is really paying attention to those, um, to those behaviors and then making sure that we can translate it into uh, design solutions and, uh, and strategy. And, you know, maybe we could talk about this between, you know, humans and life, but I think it's an evolution of our own practice where, you know, I think that human centered has been super important really from say the nineties up to now. Um, but to some extent as more and more designers, more and more people talk the language and they do it, it was also something um, that's not good enough about pure human human centered design because you know in terms of sustainability in terms of energy usage in terms of um, biodiversity in terms of co2 um, human centered isn't gonna get us to where we need to go <laughs> so that's why we've also been shifting a little bit more to this idea of um, of life centered and what that means and I think that's also you know part of what you all um, also value in the neutral project but it's um it's still a, a, it's still an evolution and I think on the one hand, it's I think it's really important to be leading edge and shifting towards life. Uh, on the other hand, there's still a lot of places where they haven't gotten to be human centered yet. Uh, so it's a question of, you know, how do you kind of continue to build? I look at it a little bit like a Maslow hierarchy of needs, right? Where it's not like we're going to neglect human needs. We just have to get those basic human needs met and then start considering other life forms, other species, other plants, uh, other animals um, uh, on top of that to hopefully try to find some you know, symbiosis and um, symbiosis is the sophisticated word. Win-win is the simple one <laughs> between humans and their environments and the uh, and the ways that those impact one another. Yeah, and Jeff, for our audience that maybe is not uh, familiar with this idea of human-centered design versus life-centered, could you just give like a maybe two-minute overview of the difference between the two? Yeah, so I, I described some of the, you know, methods and ways that we think about human-centered. And I think Life-centered is probably, you know, two ways to it. One is, uh, you know, thinking about plants, species, animals, um, the environment with as much care and sort of investigation uh, as we do human behavior um, and understanding those needs in a similar way. Um, the other the other angle to it is to, in terms of life-centered is, you know, thinking even about a little bit more broad about what is, what is needed to sustain life. Um, and that idea of sustaining life in all of its forms, um, I think is also just a, uh, just a shift, right? So it's not only, um, human centered, but life sustaining, um, I, I think gives us some, on the one hand, you can talk about people being, you know, life, life sustaining from a human perspective is more about jobs and the, uh, safety and, uh, well-being and education. So it adds more layers there in terms of human. And then if you think life, um, sustaining also in terms of, you know, like I mentioned, plants, biodiversity, other other species, other parts of the environment, then it also sort of expands the core. So it's really just that um, expansion and it's adding to our, I think the ambition that we should have with our design, with our neighborhoods and communities where of course it should be good for people, but it has to be also good for um, everything else that humans impact, uh, including sort of nature and the, and the planet as a whole. Yeah, it's definitely a much broader definition to kind of this idea of, how do we build cities? And I think it's definitely something that we need of where we're at right now with both our cities, but also just the ecosystem as a whole. So that's cool. I think uh, yeah. one thing that we had talked about before the show started was this idea of system living methodology, um, which sounds like is kind of how Gail has taken both this human, human centered design and life centered design and kind of plugged into one spot. But maybe you could just give a little bit more background on what that methodology is. Yeah, so there's a few different dimensions um, to it really, right? I mean, we like to think about um, from whether it be, you know, economic 
sort of positioning to the cultural life of a place to the um uh you know sort of retail and business uh part of a place to the um education uh element so trying to be a little bit more all encompassing and really focusing a lot on this idea of health and well-being um again both for individuals and um for the for the broader sort of environment as a um as a way to work with that and so what this means is that it sounds a little bit abstract right but i could tell you a couple of like specific cases where it starts to um take shape so we were working with um a foundation in london that was really concerned about childhood obesity and these guys had done a lot of work with food companies and you know schools and weren't having a lot of success and so they said hey we think that the built environment has a big impact on on kids on their eating habits and whether or not they become obese but we don't have any real knowledge or understanding of it so so they hired us to begin to to look at that question and you know true to the methods i mentioned before the first thing we started doing is um, talking to kids um, about the things that they care about, sort of spending time with them in their everyday routine, seeing where they go before and after school, where they hang out, um, observing those hangout spots. And so we began to learn that, you know, bus stops in south of London, where you have these really high childhood obesity rates, in some of these neighborhoods, you have over 50% of 12-year-olds olds are obese. And so in those neighborhoods, we're seeing that the only place for teens, 12, 13, 14-year-olds to hang out uh, was actually at bus stops. And if we widen our gauge, if we widen our gaze a little bit, we see that almost at every bus stop, there's a unhealthy food store. There's a McDonald's. There's a chicken shop, as they call it in London. Um, there's like a, you know, a place selling essentially candy, fatty, salty food. Um, that's what the kids want, supposedly. Um, but it was right next to the environment that they could actually hang out in, right next to this bus stop. So we, you know, started to take this data and identified essentially this sort of Bermuda triangle of health is that here you have a place where kids are taking the bus to get around the city. When they're at the bus stop, they have extra time at the bus stop while they're waiting. You have a place like McDonald's. They can go into McDonald's and hang out. Um, when their mom calls and asks them where they are, they can say that they're there. Everyone feels safe, but their sort of full everyday routine is just with no other options except for essentially unhealthy food. So we took this data to our health related client and said, hey, you know, to deal with health, we actually have to talk to the transport department. So we went and talked to the transport department and said, hey, you guys could have a big impact on this, pay more attention to where your bus stops are, set more requirements for who can, you know, locate next to them. And they're like, I, I, my bit, my job is getting the buses on time. I'm not a health, uh, a health guy, right? Um, go and talk to the real, real estate folks in the city, economic development. It's like, hey, do you guys know that people are paying a premium to sell essentially unhealthy food close to the bus stops, you should do something about it. It's like, no, that's not our, uh, that's not our, um, you know, job. We're just here to make sure that there's business and stuff in the area. Um, and the health folks, we say, Hey, you guys, you guys should talk to the transit folks. Health guys are like, Hey, we're dealing with this health, uh, you know, obesity issue. So essentially <laughs> to me, it's like, it's, it became no, it's everyone's business. Um, but the way that our cities are spread up between the stake, between the stakeholders, between the, how the money is distributed, between how it's governed, there was really no way um, to crack this nut and no one's done anything about this um, in London. And ironically, you know, the mayor of London spent a lot of money to ban fast food advertising on bus shelters, not realizing that, you know, maybe you don't see a picture of the fries there at the bus shelter, but you could smell them because the, <laughs> the McDonald's is right there. So it's, it's this kind of siloed thinking. Um, it's this, um, sort of neglecting of the fact that humans don't experience the city in departmental silos of planning, transportation, uh, et cetera. Um, that is really what we're trying to fight against and um, trying to talk much more, <laughs> um, you know, broadly and holistically, but I have to say we haven't made much progress on that, uh, on that piece of work there. So there's still a lot more to do. Yeah. What do you think the solution is? I mean, it sounds like it's, quite complicated especially when it comes to london in such a big city with i'm sure these departments are massive and so how do you work with all these different stakeholders to come up with a solution because it sounds like the solution is relatively easy like 
just move the bus stops, right? Right. But the, the <laughs> way to way to get there, it sounds like is quite complicated. And so, how do you kind of bring all these people to the table to help you work through the solution, or does it need kind of this new paradigm of city operations in order to implement it? I think it needs a new paradigm, you know, because like I said, you know, we thought we, um, we thought we could come to this you know, to those stakeholders with the data, with the information, it was super eye-opening. You know, everyone that we spoke to was like, wow, that's amazing. We hadn't realized that. Uh, we didn't know that was the problem. So it was a, it was the thing where um, people then began to understand the problem, but the system just simply wouldn't uh, allow them to do that. Um, and that's why we, you know, we talk about these sort of like life systems in, in, in cities. It's a, that's, and you hear about systems thinking and all, everything like that's really a concrete example of what, uh, of what the challenge is. So, um, things being interconnected, departments and governments, uh, governance being interconnected. So unfortunately, I mean, I think we need, like you say, a paradigm shift. Um, I think we need um, hopefully more examples and probably a smaller city or probably, you know, a smaller development, um, you know, probably a, a few smaller scale sort of proof of concept uh, prototypes that say, oh, this is what it looks like when the ideas of, you know, health, sustainability, and economic development are really thought as one thing um, so that we can show some cases that can then hopefully be copied and replicated um, in different parts of the world. But unfortunately there's not too many, um, you know, examples of that. <laughs> we are working on a neighborhood here in Copenhagen um, that, you know, aspires to be the healthiest neighborhood in the world. Uh, and so we are really working um, much more intentionally um, with these ideas of health equity and sustainability more joined up, um, but it's the exception and not the uh, and not the rule. And there's still a ton of sort of hurdles that we have to get over to make that neighborhood take shape. But hopefully, you'll be able to experience it in Copenhagen in about um, parts of it in the next five years. That's awesome. Yeah, it definitely seems like Copenhagen is a catalyst for change, and I think a lot of the world looks to Copenhagen for especially urban planning and says they're doing it right, and we should try to replicate it. And I know one of those things that we talked about earlier was this kind of idea of the 15 minute city, which I think Copenhagen has been doing for almost decades now. And so what is your kind of thought and, and thesis around this, I'll say buzzword right now of the uh, 15 minute city? <laughs> yeah. So, so the 15 minute cities become a, a buzzword, like, as you say, the last, I'd say three or four or five years, um, was a brilliant guy named Carlos Moreno. Um, Colombian guy based in Paris that sort of dubbed uh, dubbed the term uh, 15 minute city. And it's funny because I was with Carlos at COP um, 28 here in Dubai. And he told me a funny story where he's like, you know, um, he put uh, what is a 15 minute city into chat GPT. And it gave him a really good response. Actually, it's like, yeah, it's all about proximity to uh, to schools and work. And you should be able to you should be able to have everything you need in your life from your job to your free time, to your um, education, to your friends, all within 50 minute walk or bike ride. And so he was thrilled that like already kind of, you know, uh, AI knew what um, knew what it was. And and then he was you know feeling pretty proud of this. And so he asked ChatGPT who came up with the 15 minute concept. Um, and it told him Yan Gale. Uh, <laughs> so <laughs> um so that, I think that's <laughs> also indicative of, you know, Yan's work, our work at Gale, the what we've been taking inspiration from from Copenhagen has sort of been promoting these ideas of the 15 minute city for, you know, literally decades. But it took, you know, Carlos and others to really, uh, of course, build upon it, clarify it, give it a name. That's something that I think people could um, uh, understand and and build upon. But it is you know, this whole idea of walkable communities, this whole idea of um, uh, safety and uh, and street life. You know, my kids here in Copenhagen have been able to bike to school um, on their own since they were like seven, eight years old. And now they're 11 and 14 and they're, you know, incredibly independent. Um, they visit friends, they go to soccer and gymnastics practice. They, um, you know, can visit um Tivoli amusement park here and they can get uh they can get around. So for me, there's a lot of definitions of 15 minute city, but I see it a lot as, you know, 
can your 11 or 14 year old have a life <laughs> independent of you? Uh, that might be one of the, you know, the key KPIs uh, as, uh, as we define this. So um, everyone should be going for a 15 minute neighborhood, at least as much as they can. Um, but you'll know when you have it, if, um, uh, if your kids can actually use it. Yeah. While you were talking, Jeff, I just typed in 15 minute city into chat GPT and uh, we'll, we'll put the response in the chat, but the overview is the concept of a 15 minute city refers to urban planning and design that aims to create neighborhoods where residents can access most of their daily needs within a 15 minute walk or bike from their homes. The idea is to reduce reliance on cars, promote sustainability, enhance quality of life and improve overall urban mobility. And then it gives like five key uh, indicators of, of a 15 minute city, which is hilarious that uh, even the guy who founded it said Chappie GPT has a good response. So we'll add yeah. that into our, <laughs> into our show. Yeah. Notes. yeah. yeah. Um, Easier to define than it is to, uh, is to build because I think, you know, urbanists are, you know, good urbanists and architects have known these things uh, for many, many years, but, you know, back to that London story, there's just so many barriers um, to actually getting it done. And I think now we're in a stage where we actually know what to build. We know what we should be aspiring to. And, and now it's just about getting smarter, uh, more systemic, um, more systematic, more sophisticated in the how, how we, how do we actually deliver it? Um, so I guess that's, you know, um, that's the next challenge. Yeah. And it also sounds like we need to really educate uh, policymakers of what what this is and how they can help kind of implement it. Because I think a lot of it is really this kind of, if you have a good public-private partnership within a city, it's, I mean, these concepts are relatively easy to implement. But as you found out in London, if you don't have that, it almost stops you even even before you get started. So I yeah. think that's really important as well as to really advocate for the cities to actually implement these ideas and concepts. Yeah, exactly. And I think I, I just want to emphasize, I mean, I love Copenhagen. I think it's incredibly livable. Um, it's been a great place to raise a family. Um, but it's not like every place should be Copenhagen, right? And I, and I don't think everyone needs to live necessarily in a 15-minute city. This is not like a, you know, a order uh, that everyone must do this. But I think we talk a lot about the word invitation. Um, we talk a lot about this, uh, in terms of making things possible, uh, you know, providing alternatives. And I think just as you say, there's so much, you know, sort of win-win between the public and private sector in these type of communities, um, smaller footprint, you, you, you need less infrastructure. So it costs less to maintain and operate the city. You, um, have closer proximity between services. So you can have a lot of overlaps, make services more affordable you increase social connectivity and make it easier for people to you know support one another and not be lonely so there's so many benefits of it that we can invite for we can we can make it possible and if people choose to live in that environment then they should have the option it should be affordable and sustainable um but it's not like every place needs to be like that it's important that we um um obviously uh respect the different you know local cultures and and traditions in places but i think the the problem is now is there's not enough examples there's not en enough invitations for that type of lifestyle yeah yeah exactly if someone wants it there's not access to it so yeah i want to transition into our last segment to make sure we have enough time to discuss this but you wrote a, a very compelling essay um that you published on linkedin that we'll put in our show notes called urban kindness for beginners which i think is a great title but you give a really interesting story about your kids. And I was wondering if maybe you could just share that here. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, uh, I've been living in Copenhagen for 22 years, but you learn so much um, by raising a family somewhere. And so, you know, I had this sort of aha moment with my um, daughter and son, probably like six and three or so at the time. And we were um, about to cross the road and me being American, you know, I, I cross the road when I want. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's a walk signal or not, like, cause I'm important. Uh, uh, and my time is, you know, more important than anyone else. Those rules don't apply to everyone. Um, <laughs> not at least alone me. And so I was about to cross the street with my kids in my you know, hand and, and my daughter's like, you can't do that. You're going to mess it up for everyone else. Um, and my son kind of nodded in agreement, like with his pacifier in his mouth. And that was such a profound answer to me because, you know, my daughter wasn't saying, hey, you can't do that. It's illegal. 
uh, or you, you, you shouldn't do that because we might get hurt. You know, she had this sort of inbuilt awareness of that our actions, our behavior impacts other people's lives in the city. <laughs> and um, to me, that was like this understanding about, you know, interrelatedness and in our environments. Uh, again, it was sort of a precursor to this. Also, how I think about life centered cities is it's not only, you know, humans or my life, but it's about connections to the other um, other people's lives and other um, other species lives in places. And, and that kind of awareness, I think, is pretty fundamental um, in terms of uh, having a good city. Um, and, and it's at the end of the day, it's just about being kind, right? Because it's about realizing that your actions have an impact. It's not always about being nice all the time, right? You could be kind to a friend and tell them a harsh truth um, about how they need to get better. You know, you can be kind to your neighbor by, um, you know, asking them to, um, to take a fence down or to do something different. Right. So it's not only just about being nice, but being kind, I think is, is a word that I just love. And, um, it really shows this sort of interconnectedness. It shows this civility. It shows this, um, I think what we need in our cities. And, and I also like words like kindness and, and friendship and connection connection, because I think in the urban urban design, the real estate world, we use very sophisticated words, resilient, sustainability, carbon neutral, um, bio, biodiversity, all this stuff. And, and a lot of us just don't know what it means. Um, or we don't know how to act on it or what to do with it. Um, but I think if we can return back to, um, yeah, some of these other more everyday words and then really think hard about how we might design for them or plan for them or integrate it into our, into our policies, make it easier for people to be kind, uh, make it easier for people to feel connected, um, make sure that more and more people in a city feel cared for. Um, those are the kind of aspirations and words that I hope can guide our profession um, uh, a little bit more. And again, it, it will manifest itself. People will interpret it in different ways and different cultures and different climates and different backgrounds. But um, at the end of the day, it'd be great if we had um, at least a little bit more kindness in our environments. Yeah, I think it would help everyone in the cities we live in. You talk about this idea, Jeff, of making it easier for people to be kind. And how do you think you do that from a urban planning standpoint? Yeah, you know, I mean, this this idea I mentioned before about I can actually be quite, um, I think, you know, kind and generous with my kids in many ways because it's easier for them to, I feel, I feel like they could be on their own uh, in the city. And part of that is because there's protected bike lanes and there's, you know, really good public transit and, um Part of it also is that, you know, as, as my kids get older and they become teenagers, I think, you know, being kind and respectful in public space, um, I think we can also show people signals of how to do that. So having, you know, well-maintained um, public spaces, having, ensuring that we're giving, you know, dignified experiences, whether you're walking or uh, or taking the transit. So, you know, simple things like um, sidewalks are continuous and, um, trees and shade are plentiful. And um, regardless if it's a high income or low income neighborhood, you know, you have access to things like, you know, public transit and other amenities. I think when, when our environment sort of signals to us um, that we're, that, that we mean something that we are cared for. Um, I think, I think it just sort of lets us know that we're, we can also be kind to one another. Um, you know, there's another example, which I know is difficult in the U S is that you walk around Copenhagen there's like so many kind of, you know, you, you could say a little bit, you know, dangerous situations, like there's waterfront all over the place and there's no fences um, to keep, keep people from falling in the water. There's, you know, exciting kind of skate park roofs and, um, and places to climb and, uh, and skate and be wild and, and to sort of be, be young. And there's no signs that say, you know, you can't do X, Y, and Z. And I think that those signals really matter. You know, when we, when, when urban design, shows people, hey, I trust you. I trust you to be uh, a good citizen. I trust you to take care of yourself and your community. I think that that signal then tells other people, hey, I can also trust my neighbor. I can also be a trustworthy person. Um, so it sounds a little bit on the one hand, like um, maybe like a stretch, but having seen it firsthand in, in Copenhagen over the years, and having talked to people, you know, this is one of the places where people trust one another the most. And there's many reasons for that. Um, 
but the urban environment plays its role. Um, and I think trusting other people in the way that you design for them engenders a sense of trust that they then reciprocate. And I think um, that's another, you know, a trustworthy city, <laughs> um, a dignified, a dignified city. Those are some other words that I think are really important that we think about. Yeah, that's interesting how even kind of a simple thing, as much as a, as a sign could kind of invoke this idea of kindness in cities, but it does make a lot of sense because it's, especially in the US, I think probably more than anywhere else, you see all these signs of don't smoke here and don't have your dog poop here and don't skateboard here. And it's all these like don'ts and it's really not trusting the public of, hey, can they make the right decision and be kind? So yeah. Exactly. Yeah. My kids have noticed it too. And we were walking around San Francisco and there were so many like fun little ramps and railings and things. And there was just a sign on everything like, you know, don't play, don't do this, don't do that. And they were like, why can't you do anything in America? I thought this was the, <laughs> the, the land of the free, <laughs> the land of the free. I can't say it. That's not a direct quote from them, but they, uh, <laughs> that, but, but they did say like, why can't you do anything in San Francisco? Um, and it, I think it plays into our psyche. Um, yeah. Um, I think it, uh, I think it really does. And especially when we grow up in those situations and especially, I think this is a, a true in America, right? Like, especially if you go to one neighborhood and it is really nice and there aren't any signs and everyone's being, you know, kind to one another. And then if you go to another neighborhood and, uh, and you got fences everywhere and barbed wire and, um, you know, uh, gates over doors. And I think it also just gives the impression of, um, Oh, this isn't a place where we trust one another, or we, 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 this environment is harsh and unkind to people. So they will be too. And when you have that kind of difference in cities and you experience that difference, um, I think it's just incredibly harmful. Yeah. No, I agree with you. One of the topics I wanted to talk about with you, Jeff, was this idea between kind of intertwining the social sciences into cities and design, which I think is an interesting topic that we could probably do more of. But with your studies at London School of Economics, what was kind of the maybe conclusion or, or practical outcome of how could we do more of that? Yeah, well, I think the well in practice, at first in the education, you know, having a program like this where you do, lit, you know, literally it was 12 to 15 anthropologists, social scientists, and then it was 12 to 15, you know, architects, urban planners, and designers. And so the first step, I think, is like putting these people from very different backgrounds together and forcing them to collaborate. And, um, you know, I learned from some of my friends who study anthropology, they're like, why, why is everything in architecture and design like a problem? Why can't it just be something that you analyze and understand? Why does it have to be a problem to solve? Right. Um, so that was like, oh, yeah, wow. Okay, what is that? That's actually super interesting. So there's something fundamental about these different disciplines putting them together. I think there's something also real challenging about it, right? It's like there's, you know, the words mean different things. You talk about um, scenarios or programming or um, um, uh, like equity, <laughs> right? Those words mean very different things in, in, in architecture and design versus like sociology and anthropology. Um, so there's a lot there about that's, that, that's hard, but super important to work together. I think this other idea, back to this idea about a right answer or not, and just really trying to spend time and to learn um, is something I, you know, gained a lot from in the education. And I think architects and designers can do that as well. Um, and what I mean by that is like, you know, I, th I think a lot about, I, 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 I love designing with kindness. I also love this idea of empathy um, and really, you know, trying to put yourself in someone else's shoes. Uh, a simple story, you know, we did this work in, in Canada and people were, it was a transportation plan. And we found out that majority of the decision makers in the city in Canada had like never taken the bus. They never taken the bus and never ridden the bike. And we said, well, let's do something together where we, you know, split up into groups and citizens and, ci and city makers, we mix you up and some will take the bus, some will drive the car and some will like ride their bike and we'll go from A to B. And you get this totally different experiences. And all of a sudden you're like, oh man, it's really hard and scary and dangerous to ride my bike. Or man, that bus ride was bumpy and and smelly. And and so I learned, I think, <laughs> in sociology and anthropology, this idea of how you put yourself in someone else's shoes, how you take the time to experience reality from their perspective. Um, this idea of empathy um, and compassion. Um, simple stuff, right? I think we just need more, more of that. Um, 
in our in our governments, in our in our practices, in our you know um, in our professional um, in our professional life, it would help a lot. Yeah, I mean, I think even from like the development standpoint, we need more of that because I think you have a lot of developers and even architects that are designing places where people live, but not really living in those places, especially when it comes to apartments. Like you have a lot of developers living in these huge homes that they are designing exactly. apartments that they they don't even, or they haven't lived in for decades or maybe never lived in. And I think it's yeah critical for if you're designing something to really understand and empathize with the user. Yeah. And what's better than that than doing a firsthand uh, first hand knowledge, right? Like, you know, you see those simple examples of, you know, trying to just put yourself in a wheelchair and get around the city. Um, or, um, we've even done work with working with like early, early childhood development. And we put some GoPro cameras on some, you know, three and four year olds in the city and experience the city from their perspective. Um, so, so there's a lot of different, I think, ways to, ways to do this, everything from making a developer spend a night in a hotel to just, you know, putting a camera on someone else's point of view, <laughs> but um, small and large sort of experiments, I think would actually, you know, make a lot of a difference in terms of collaboration, in terms of um, much more pragmatic solutions, much more human solutions, um, simple things like that. Um, I think it'd be great if we did more. Yeah. Yeah. I'm definitely going to start implementing that for us and our our employees to have them start living in some of our our buildings for at least a a few weeks to really understand the user experience. So yeah, that's nothing's like idea. firsthand. Nothing beats firsthand experience. Yeah, exactly. Well, Jeff, I really appreciate you taking the time to join the podcast and talk about this stuff. It's been really fascinating, and uh, hopefully, we can talk more in the future. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, appreciate the opportunity, and uh, yeah, really love what you guys are doing, and. Um, I think, yeah, what, best of luck with your, uh, with your projects and uh, everything else. Awesome. Thanks for coming on, Jeff. Thank you. At The Neutral Project, we're not just building structures. We're building a legacy of sustainability, helping align your investments with a sustainable future. We'd like to thank you for being part of this conversation. For more information and to stay up to date on how we're reshaping the future through environmentally conscious development, visit our social media accounts or website at theneutralproject.com. Thanks again for tuning in, and we'll see you next time on The Neutral Podcast.